lesson of the new quarter. Yay! Are we happy about it? Amen. Wasn't the last quarter wonderful, Genesis? Didn't you love it? I loved it. It ended on such a high note. Joseph says before he dies, don't leave my bones here in this land. Take me to the promised land. And he kind of gave us an image that says, hey, this is not our home. Even in death, we're going to head to a promised land. So we're in something different this week, this quarter. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much. It's Sabbath day. We ask that you'll send your spirit to be with us these moments as we study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the stories in Genesis, everybody knows them from heart, right? You could say them in your sleep almost. The stuff that we're going to read this quarter might be a little different, right? It's not a book. The last few quarters, we've been looking at a book of the Bible or what Adventists sometimes call our fundamental beliefs. This quarter, we're going to be looking at something different, and we called it, they're calling the lesson the, In the Crucible with Christ. So here's the start, and our lesson doesn't really do it until lesson two. Can anybody help me with the definition of crucible? A crucible. In the Crucible with Christ. This is not a test. This is the pretest. Crucible with Christ. Anybody? I have the definition from Webster, but if... Okay, you're saying grind things. Okay, brother. Pressure. Pressure. Okay, pressure. That's a good definition. Okay, good for you. Okay, so here's what Webster says about it. Webster says this: a crucible is a is a vessel is a vessel of very refractive refracted materials such as porcelain, a vessel that's made of porcelain or something that's used for melting a substance that requires a high degree of heat. But then when you read on, it says, like Brother said, pressure, you're being tense, crucible, right? So our lessons this quarter are going to be being melted, maybe, being in high heat situations, maybe, being under a lot of pressure, maybe. All these things we're going to look at, okay? So question for Brother Bill, if you get sick while you're on vacation, is it still worth it? Uh, the jury's still out on that. Okay, okay. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back, Wisdoms. Holiday vacation, wonderful, right? Surgery, not the surgery part, but the holiday vacation part was wonderful. Welcome to the Richards and the Cooks in the back. Welcome to the high-haired fellow in the middle there. You said that the higher the hair, the closer to God. The closer to God. There you go. And you have your son has a head spiked up. Wonderful. Okay, great for you. Okay, folks, so we're looking today at Psalms 23. Anybody can say it in their sleep with their eyes closed. Let's say it together. Let's read it together. Psalms 23. I'm going to read it from NY, NIV. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Somebody else says, first one says something else in their version. I shall not want. That's an old favorite. Anybody else? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Anybody's other version says something different? That's it. Okay, that's cool. Okay, that's verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside quiet waters. Anybody else? Still waters. Brother Doctor, you better help me out here. What's verse 2 in your version say? There's a lot of doctors in here. Brother Richards. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters, the quiet waters, what? Still waters. Yes. Okay. Verse 3. He, re he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His namesake. Anybody else? Paths is righteousness. Mine says right paths. Everybody else has something similar, right? Right paths. Okay, verse 4. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Is that pretty much what we all have? Even when I walk through a valley of frightful shadows facing death, hmm. I will fear no evil, because you are with me. Your rod and your staff. I like that. Which one's that, Burley? The clear word. The clear word. Okay, I like that one. 
Somebody else over here, it sounds like you had something different, Sister Nioma. Even if I pass through death, dark, or ravines, I will fill in no disaster, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff for your turn. Oh, I like that one. Okay, that's that was what, what was that? Ooh, okay, verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Anybody different? My cup overfloweth. Some people say you could put a floweth if you want there. Okay, I like that. Okay, and then finally, verse 6. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So those words are words that we all know, right? And so we're going to look at it through this idea of I'm in the crucible with Christ. I'm in the crucible with Christ. So, the Lord is my shepherd, verse 1. Pictures of shepherds. We're not, um, we're not shepherds in our day and age, right? Although I do have a book here that might help some of you. I'm going to give this to Brother Daniel afterward. Raising goats for dummies. <laughs> shepherd, being a shepherd. For dummies, okay? We don't know anything about it, but what is it? When you hear the Lord is my shepherd, what does that bring to you in mind? Because this was a very familiar motif. The shepherd motif was very familiar in the day and age. Yes? When I was a teenager in Tinkerville, California, I moved on the sheep ranch. Uh-oh. And they were not shepherds. They were sheep herders. And there's a difference. Okay, talk to us, sister. Okay. Ah. So who would think that in middle of Kentucky we'd find a shepherd, a former shepherd? Amen. Amen. There was a difference there, right? Brother Richard and I, my granddad had cattle. Now you treat cattle really different different than you do sheep, right? You kind of can be rough with cattle because they're bigger and sometimes you got to give it to them to get them to move on. Dogs, some other things to kind of keep them motivated. But sheep, you couldn't dare treat them that way because they're too fragile of an animal, even though, as you said, sister, some do. The shepherd was not a person who drives the animal with that stick. He's calling them to him. They're following him. Okay, there are some texts in the Bible that kind of bring that out, and I thought maybe we'd look at a couple of them if we would. I like my favorite. John 10, 11 through 16. Can somebody look at that text? Because that text lays it out. His sister says, John 10, 11 through 16. Jesus is talking here about a shepherd. And if somebody else could look at Isaiah 40, verse 11. Because it gives these people had a picture when they read this word, the Lord is my shepherd. They had a picture in their mind of what a shepherd is. And today we're like, mm, what does that mean? Anybody have those verses that want to take a brother? Good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Yes, that sounds different from what your mother in law was saying. Because these guys with dogs and whatever, they didn't sound like they were gonna be giving their life, right? They're they're in the business. Okay, anybody else want to keep going on? That was verse eleven. Anybody want to keep moving on? John ten, verse eleven, verse twelve. Brother Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so brother through the mass said Jesus he repeated the words of Jesus the person who's hired hey something bad happens the wolf comes guess what he does I'm looking out for myself these sheep can make it on their own he takes off because why he doesn't have any kind of affection for him. He doesn't care about him. It's just money for him. He's looking and saying, well, there's 20 bucks behind me, but it's better that I get out of here and leave that 20 bucks or whatever dollar number he has in his mind for the sheep than to risk his life for it. Keep reading verse 12. Somebody. Sister Janet. 13. Yes. 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 That's, you know, Psalms 23 is believed to be written by David. So he had in his mind this good shepherd thing. Anybody else? Verse 13, I think it was, we left off. Sister? A hired worker behaves like this because that's all he is, a hired worker. So it doesn't matter to him what happens to the sheep. 
Hmm, yes. Doesn't matter. It's not family to him. It's not a business. I mean, it's just business, right? Okay. Okay. So let's let's skip over to Isaiah 40 and 11. Somebody? Isaiah 40 and verse 11. Because we're trying to get a picture before we go to Psalms 23 of what a shepherd, a good shepherd looks like versus a bad shepherd. We use John 10 because John 10 talks about the good shepherd, but it also compares it to the bad shepherd, a hireling, a person who's just hired to do it. Verse 40 of, oh, it's up there. Oh my goodness. Marcy, you're all right. Okay, so somebody want to take a look at this? The shepherd takes care of his flock. He takes care of his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arm. He carries them close to his heart. He's gentle. He leads those little ones. Can you picture in your mind a little lamb where the shepherd is holding it close to his heart? Oh my goodness. That's the picture that David probably wanted us to have in mind when he talked about the picture of the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is our good shepherd. Okay, so what can we learn of shepherds from this task, from these texts? What do you think we can learn? What's a good thing? I always try to do the same thing. This is so crazy, but I always try to learn three things, I think, during every lesson. I think, number one, the Lord is our shepherd is the first thing. Oh, that's so obvious. Two, if we're sheep, we have to follow the shepherd. And number three, we're always we're going to pass through dark valleys in this journey we call life. It's not going to be all good pastures, green pastures. There's going to be some dark times. So, what can we learn about being a good shepherd from these texts? Because we're going to apply these lessons to the Lord as our shepherd. And, we, and I know this is painful because we don't know anything about sheep in this day and age. The mo only one person in here knows anything about it, and she's sitting in the back. Oh, two people. Oh, excuse me. I grew up with goats. <laughs> Goat and a sheep. Come on. I very much grew up with goats. I know goats. Okay. My neighbor was selling his sheep. Okay. I ended up with them. Okay. education. Okay. Sheep, sheep versus goat. Sheep are a lot stronger. Is that right? Okay. Okay. Stupider. Okay. Okay. They are a lot stronger. If they decide they're not going to go where you want them to go, or they're going to challenge you, they can put you on your butt a lot harder and faster than a goat can. Okay. Those are good lessons, I guess. All right. Okay. 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 So thank you all. Animals. Okay. She's using she's using different words than you, but that's okay. Okay. So Sister Burley. Uh, we grew up on a farm and we had cattle. Yes. Never had sheep. Yes. While my oldest smart. brother went to work for someone who had sheep, he said they are the dumbest animals in the world. <laughs> he said. They wander off. They don't take care of themselves. I mean, they get in trouble. Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Be careful here because the next thing is like the Lord is our shepherd, but the next thing is we are his sheep. We're the sheep of his flock, right? And he still loves us. Oh, my goodness. So I hear you all using this. Okay. So here's the thing. When we were kids, Richard and I, dumb was a four-letter word. You could not use it in our house, right? You're dumb or you're stupid. My mom just didn't like us saying it. Lorna, if you say even it to the dog in our house, you stupid little dog, she's like, mm, don't use that word around my dog. It's like, take it easy, you know? Okay, but the reality of it is, if the Lord is our shepherd and we're the sheep, hey, you don't think the people of this day, when they heard that, they said, oh man, we're sheep? Why is he using this kind of terminology for us? Brother. Okay, stay away from the. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. Here's a story that I, I don't 
I'm not a shepherd. I don't know if this is true. But they said that the herdsmen, these shepherds, would keep the sheep together in a big fenced-in area. I'm using the word fenced-in because they didn't have wires. At night, maybe three or four shepherds together, it was safer for them to herd their sheep into this one gated area, right? When they left in the morning, the shepherd would just say, okay, sheep, I'm going, boom, I'm shepherd number one. And guess what? His sheep would follow him out because he knew them and they knew him. Jesus actually kind of referred to that, said, my sheep know my voice, right? And I know them. So, oh my goodness. What kind of, yes. You know, we shouldn't be making fun of goats, but in reality, it sounds like we are the goats. Okay. God's the shepherd. We wander off and we do our own thing instead of doing like the sheep should do. Okay, so okay. Not making fun of goats. You know, we're forgetting all the rest of the Bible where, where Jesus is talking about <laughs> going and rescuing the Indian sheep. And, okay, so. Okay, so this sounds like the this sounds like the old argument: the farmer and the cowman should be friends. All right, don't make me start to sing that song. All right, everybody knows the farmer and the cowman can be friends. All right, so I get it, and I think brother may be right. Our focus needs to be on the Lord is our shepherd. He's the shepherd, right? Let's not get into so much how weird the sheep are, because guess what? All our sheep and gone astray. Yes, brother. So the old that you gave about. In that day and time, it's still true. I mean, that's that's how how they sort them out over in the Middle East now. And I, I like what the brother said back here about focusing on the shepherd. It behooves us to make sure that we're listening to the right shepherd's voice. Yes. And so I think that is our ultimate responsibility because if we listen to the wrong shepherd, we will follow that person. And it will not end well for us. Right. When there's a power vacuum, if you will, a leadership vacuum, people go to something that's weird, right? If we're listening to the Lord, our author here in the lesson said, we're going to stay on this path following this shepherd. But if we let ourselves go astray, listen to the wrong voices, we can get off the path, right? Okay, so... Okay, so I think we had fun with that. Thank you so much for it. Keep participating, keep participating. So my number two point, I think, is we've got to follow the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What does that mean to you when you say, I shall not want? Lorna and I, we have one car. We sold the other one. We want another car. Do we need another car is the debate we're having with each other. Can we go to be a one car? Yes. Yes, sister, we do need to. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> That's the question we're debating. Lorna and I spent 10, 15 years when we were in Washington, D.C. with as a one car family. Yes, it was tough. You spent a lot of days waiting at the bus stop in 30 degree weather saying, where is she? Where is she? It's hard to this. It's hard for us in this world to distinguish wants from needs. And I'm saying, this text says, the Lord is our shepherd, I shall not want, I shall not be in want. He's not even talking about needs, right? He said he already took care of the needs. You don't even are in want. So what does that mean to us? Not to be in wants, I shall not want. I just want to talk about that for a minute. I mean, this is a good shepherd. I shall not want. Oh, they can give more to this program or that program or this mission or that outreach. And that's true, they can. But there's nothing wrong with having um, a comfortable life. Okay. And God wants us to have a comfortable life so that we can show other nations or people or in our neighborhood, hey, guess what? I'm protected by my shepherd. Okay. I am kept in this in this well because of him okay so i led you down a a, a a a rocky path on purpose right on purpose to give you want meaning physical wants but is that what the text is talking about our physical wants do you think it could be, be right okay well i think again as pastor says context too, context right is are you going to look at in the context of when that was written yes what did people want slash need, need. 
in that day and time. They needed food, they needed lodging, they needed water. And that's exactly what a sheep, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a sheep, the sheep need is food, water, water, and lodging as well. And I think many, many of the times we, we think when we're looking at these different things, well, I want a second car. Right. But you may need a second right. car, and that's that, that's a debate I'm not going to enter into. Okay. For safety. You're sake. too smart. And, okay. and so, but the, but the big thing is we we have things that we specifically need, and I think that's what Christ uh, is trying to tell us through that particular verse. Does He give us some of our wants? Absolutely, sure. He does. He absolutely does. But, you know, he doesn't give all of our wounds or else we become full of brass. Right. So Maslow, if you guys are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's what you're thinking about, right? The bottom need is what you said, food, shelter, safety, security, right? Right. Yeah, safety, security. But because we live in this Western society, this modern society, guess what? We're up on the top of thing. I need a good education. I need... I need art in my house. I gotta have art in my house. It doesn't feel like a house if it doesn't have the proper amount of art in it. We've climbed that hierarchy of needs so high that now when we read this text about this 3,000 year old text, we're saying to ourselves, are they talking about art in their house? Are they talking about a second car? No, they're not talking about a second car. The context of this is they're still at the bottom rung. Safety, food, shelter, right? Some kind of security. Okay, so the question is, where's my glasses? For those of you who don't know, this is water. It's in a coffee cup. I didn't want somebody to say, he's drinking coffee. No, it's just water, okay? You can test it out later. So Sister. He so he says. I am a Christian who's still suffering from lack of food. Hmm. And it's the lack of water. Hmm. To me, when it says, and what is my shit washing out one, I believe it's referring to, I will not want Okay. Good boy. Okay. Good for you. You know, it's like I've seen Bible texts misunderstood and misinterpreted, misinterpreted. Like the staff. The shepherd carried one piece of yes. equipment and the staff. And the other end of it was a rod. Right. He never took the rod and beat the sheep. Right. Right. He took the staff to pull Guide the sheep him. back. Yeah, there you go. And to me, that indicates the shepherd's heart of love. You know, love draws us to Christ. Okay. Sister. Um, Young sister. He says that the um, sheep will follow the shepherd's voice. Yes. But if you don't, if they don't want to listen, they won't because they're stubborn. Yeah. But the sheep know that if they follow the shepherd, they will get Yes. 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 Thank you for that. Good point. Thank you. In, I'm going to say the name wrong. You've been watching the news for the last five months, right? And you've seen one country bombing another country, right? Yeah. We're not going to say their names on TV. Okay. Lorna and I have been having this funny debate, strange debate, really. When somebody bombs your apartment, what do you take with you? That's our debate. And I see, I'll see some people with everything, they're carrying everything they own. It's like, uh, really? And they see some guys like, oh, I'm out of here. I'm just going to take this. And they leave their country, their home, their house, everything with just what they could grab in their hand. You see some people still carrying everything. And I say to myself, I wonder if this is going to say anything to us as people, how we decide what's important to us when it gets tight, because, you know, Christians and Adventist, we like to say there's a time coming that'll be troublesome, a troublesome time. We've even named it the time of trouble, right? When that time of trouble comes, what's going to be important to us? I don't know the answer to it. I'm asking, you know, because sometimes we get hung up on stuff and things and stuff and things, and the shinier stuff is the better stuff. Bigger things are the better things. And I say to myself, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What is that going to mean to me in the coming journey that we're going to be on? When I get to those dark valleys, what happens? What do I leave behind? Okay.
I'm getting weird. Number two thing. We must follow the shepherd. Verse 2 and 3 say, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me behind, beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. So, anybody want to take a shot at why does He lead us? Why are we calling these the right paths? What makes them the right paths? Our author pointed out why he thought these paths that the Lord leads us to are right just paths. Right paths. Why right paths? What makes it a right path? How do you know when you're on the right path? Some paths. Okay. Anybody else? How do we know it's the right path? The shepherd, it doesn't really matter what we know. The shepherd knows where the right path is. And if we follow the shepherd, the right shepherd. then we'll be okay. Okay. You know, a modern equivalent would be trying to follow a GPS. Mm. GPS doesn't always know the right path. Mm -hmm. okay? You can wind up in some weird mm -hmm. places, but we still follow the GPS. Okay. And, and instead, basically, what we do is in that particular set of verses, again, we focus on the shepherd, not the path, because the shepherd has our trust and the shepherd knows the path. Okay, good for you. I like that. I saw some little wiggling around. around. Okay, good for me. Listen to this. This is how our, how our author of the lesson points out the right paths. This is the right paths lead in the right direction. Can we go with that? All right. The right paths keep us in harmony with God. You like that one? Okay. The right paths train us to be with the right, to be the right kind of people. We're good with that? Okay. The right paths give us the right witness to others who aren't on the right path. Ooh. Okay. There's a text in the Bible that says, straight is the gate, narrow the path that leads to righteousness, and few. There's going to be few people that find themselves on this path. Very few, right? But wide is the gate. Broad is the path that leads to in the wrong direction. And everybody's going to be on it, right? Okay, so the right path may seem narrow and it may seem rough. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. I like that. I like that. Okay. So let me ask you this. Can anybody share a time? Because this says, verse says, I lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Has, can anybody relate, share a time in their life where you felt like the Lord was leading you down a quiet path and a green pasture? Everything was going good for the sheep because we're headed into the crucible with Christ. Um, there's, there's a problem if you don't know the, the quiet waters. Um, you know about that, right? If uh, the waters swirl around, the sheep can get busy and fall in. Mm. Okay. So I've also heard them say that the sheep you know, if you heard that saying you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force him to drink, that's because they got that big nose that says, mm, this water doesn't smell good, and they won't drink it. In fact, cowboys wouldn't drink until after they saw their horse drink because they said, if he drinks, it's good. Sheep, they say, don't have that good sense, right? But they don't like water that moves. It makes them startled. You can sometimes see sheep jumping over things. That's, you say, what is he jumping over? A shadow, a movement, a reflection. So they have to have waters that are still. Okay, so question for you, and I'm just going to get to it. Because we're talking about being in the crucible with Christ. If things aren't going well for you, does it mean the shepherd has abandoned you in a bad place? Because as, as Christians, you know, we have this prosperity thing in our heads, weird as it is, that the Christian must be doing better than everybody else. And so if I'm not doing good, I mean, my house isn't big, my car's not new, whatever, maybe the Lord is, maybe I'm on the wrong path. Maybe I'm following the wrong shepherd. Maybe, maybe I'm not being obedient. Yes. 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 
Hmm. Maybe. But he's no longer the faithful anyway. Okay. And through it all, at the end, he could see how God. He could see the plan come together. He said. Okay. Okay. I'm asking these questions wrong because you folk are not responding properly. Well, have me. you noticed when things are going good? Yes. You seem to focus on what you're doing and everything else, and you kind of forget about God. Sometimes. Okay. But when something bad happens, where's okay. the first place you're going to turn? Okay. You're Thank going you. to realize I need God in my life. Okay. So that. I think He gives us those trials. Okay. So Sister Verley answered my next question. How can we say, how can the easy path in life also become a hazard to us? Does anybody. Did everybody hear Sister Verley? The easy path, the smooth, easy way, sometimes, even though we love it, thank you very much, it can become a hazard to us because we get, like you say, this pretty soon, do I really even need a shepherd? I mean, I'm on this smooth path. I'm doing fine. I got a great job. Everything's cool. Jack, it's all cool. It's good. I don't really need a shepherd. I don't need anybody showing me what to do. I'm grown, actually. And I don't need you telling me what to do. Sister. I'm going to go back to that other thing. It says uh, he leaves besides the water. Yes. If he gets the waters, you have to make a plan. Hmm. Keep the water still. So the shepherd has gone before the sheep and prepared it for them. So even on whatever path he's leading them, he's already been there to make sure that they're safe. So if they're on the good path and everything's easy, they still have the still water. If they're on a rocky path and, you know, things are, are difficult and you've got to keep your ears up and listen to those guys, the water is still still. So the mm. shepherd's already been there to make sure things are I like that. Thank you for that. Shepherd has gone ahead. He made out. He's not taking them into an unknown territory, right? He's been there before. He's walked this path before. And now he knows no matter what. We can know no matter what he's been there. We can have that confidence. Okay. I think for your other question, Robert, too, like when Jose was here, we did a lot of hiking. And it seemed to me like there was always that part of the path that was like really steep or really horrible. But at the end, you got to the waterfall or you got to the rock formation or whatever. So I think sometimes you have to go through difficulty just to, to see the beauty. And the shepherd knows the beauty's there. Okay. I like that. Yes, brother. I think if you look at the psalm uh, as well, it, you know, in verse 4 it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why are you not afraid? Because the shepherd is there. Okay? And he goes on to say, You, not me, not somebody else, but you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You're still in the presence of mm of whatever is causing you uh, concern or, or hurt. But the shepherd is still there. Okay, brother, you are out ahead of us by one verse. But here we go. So then I ask the question to you, does the Lord sometimes deliberately, or I should say, why does the Lord sometimes deliberately lead the sheep down dark valleys in this journey? Why? Why do we go through these dark things? Why do we go through these dark valleys? By learning to trust in him, we know that he's going to lead us the right path eventually. Okay, so I'm going to mess with you, Jack. I'm going to mess with you, okay? okay? I'm messing with you, okay? Good. I love you. So here's the thing. Does the Lord lead us down these things on purpose just to see what happens to us? Or is it just the journey of life that sometimes there are rough paths? Or is he really purposely leading us down this? I mean, there's a nice smooth road over here. Why is he leading us down this rough place? Why does Neoma have to have surgery? Why can't she just have a perfect life? Why lead us down this place? To build that faith we need. So is he doing it to her on purpose, or is it because we're in this place that there's places where things don't go right? I'm just asking, folks, just messing with you. Sometimes it's our own choices that make us. Okay. Um, Anybody else want to get in that? Sometimes it's just like no. Sometimes we go through stuff not for our own benefit, though we do benefit, but for those who are watching us. Okay. And to give us a story to connect to somebody else later down the road. Maybe. Okay. Because how are you going to witness to somebody if you haven't gone there? 
Okay. I, 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 Jesus has gone through everything so that he can be uh, the one that we look to when we need to go through things. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm going to pick on some of the medical people here. All right. Don't violate any HIPAA. Please do not violate anything that has to do with HIPAA. But sometimes you see a patient, they present at the ER, they present in the surgical ward, they present in wherever, and they got something going on with them. You say, hmm. Do you look at them and say, oh, they're just going down a dark valley. It just so happens to be a tough path. Or do you say, this jackass was smoking for 30 years and that's why they're here. I'm just asking the question. Because, you see, we're following a shepherd through some places and you say, what am I doing down here? Why, oh, I never smoked a day in my life, but I got cancer in my lungs. I just, I, I, I just want to know. So you can think whatever you want, but if you let those thoughts leak out of your head, you'll have a short career. <laughs> yes, very short career. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Brother Bill, for that. Don't ask me. Okay, don't ask you. Okay. Okay. I'll ask the spouses of medical people. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry about that. I just had to go there. Okay. So tell me somebody of a time when you were in a dark place, but you still had a sense that the Lord was guiding you there. You felt that there's still purpose why I'm here. Can anybody share that time? They says, I'm here in this place. It's dark. I don't want to be here. I'm scared. But I know the Lord is with me here. I feel like he's still guiding me. Brother Daniel. Thank you, brother. Part of the, the sin world, the sinful world that we live in, you know, we can't avoid it. But I think whenever we have a relationship with Christ and we walk daily with Him, when we are in those dark places, we know that we're not alone, and we know that there's a purpose that God's allowing us to go through. That. Okay, thank you. So you said what she said, but fancier. He said exactly what you said, but just fancier, you know. <laughs> Right? We're in this dark place. We live in this world of full of trouble. When you look in, in, in John 16 and, and 33 or so, Jesus said this world is full of trouble. <laughs> it's full of trouble, but fear not. I've overcome the world, right? So that should say to the Christian, there's going to be dark days. I'm a good shepherd. I'm with you. It's dark. Yes, it's dark. Yes, you're in the presence of your enemies, but you're in a good place. We're together. Okay, 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 okay. So then I ask you the question, what lessons have you learned, did you learn in those dark valleys? Because I know nobody raised their hand and said, oh, I was in this dark valley because I'm just going to tell you a dark valley. It's a normal, natural thing. It's going to happen to everybody in the room. We lost our parents within a course of 14 months. My mom had an Alzheimer type condition, she dies. My dad, 14 months later, he dies. And we, I can remember at his funeral, one of my brothers stood up and said, who's, who's in charge now? I mean, what, what's going on here? What, you know, and what he was saying was, our world has become so chaotic in the last 14 months, it feels like nobody's in charge. What's going on here? We were in that dark place together. And I got to say, it changed my way of looking at the Lord. I'm just going to say it, right? I had this naive notion in my mind that because I'm a Christian, I saved, saved, born again. My mom brought us into church, saved, born again. Nothing bad is ever going to happen to us. Woohoo! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Put some money in the plate. That's where I was. 40-year-old man in his 40s thinking that silly, childish thought. Man in his 60s now. Those thoughts are gone, right? Good things happen to us. Hallelujah, praise the God, I still have a Savior who rules. Bad things happen. Hallelujah, praise God, still have a Savior that rules. That's how it is. That's what I learned from that lesson. And so now I'm not so afraid of it because if somebody comes up to me and says, you won't believe what happened to my mom. Girlfriend, I do believe you. It happened to my mom. And I can tell you about it. The Lord is still with you. It's going to happen. We live in this world. Get used to it. He loves us. He's going to save us. End of Sabbath school. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That's where we're going to spend the next quarter. We're going to be looking at these dark places and saying, we're in a hot place with the Lord. It feels hot. Why? We got to go through this. The crucible that we're talking about. 
a place where things is me metal are melted. It takes refines off the things that you don't need, right? You think about a silver, you're making trying to make silver where there's a lot of impurities in silver when you just dig it out of the ground. You've got to get that stuff hot and take off those impurities. And that's what the Lord is doing with us here in this crucible. Okay, that's left in 13. Go ahead. I was asked recently how we know what's what. So last night I was thinking about it. And I was thinking, you're going along as a basic human being, mm. not a Christian, but you, you decided you're going to be. And God gives you a, a thing to do. It's just a little bitty baby step. So you decide you're going to follow that step and you do it. And right as soon as you do, you get an uh, X on your back because you've just become a target for the devil because mm. you are a person who just followed what the shepherd said. Mm. And so the wolf is going to come get you. Come after you. But you're going along and you can stay on these just little single uh, baby missions for the rest of your life. And, but you, So you only have a small X, okay. But what if God said, hey, you obeyed me, here's the next mission. Mm. And it steps up. Now you're at a, a two level, using my kids' game or limbo. Okay. Um, and this means you got an even bigger mark on your back because the wolf is not going to want you to complete okay. this mission. Okay, that's one way to look at it. And each time you, you follow these missions, you could get a bigger target on your back which is going to be your dark place. But the whole time you're doing these missions, you're following the shepherd, the, the boss is telling you what to do, you're following it, you're trusting him, you're getting the messages from him on what to be doing. And while you're getting these bigger and bigger targets on your back, you're still in his yeah. care. Okay. Because he's got to give you more missions to do. Okay, I like that. Okay, sister, I like that. Okay. Have way too much game you do time. have way too much game, and we'll talk to you about that after it's there's help for you. Yeah. And children, kids can understand. Okay? Yes. And they can put it to reality. Okay. Each, each level gets harder. Yes. Okay. Good for you. So you got to you, you want a guy over to that, Sister Ann. I think many of our crucible experiences are some of the best experiences we will ever have. Yes. Because we learn from those experiences. The Lord refines us during that time. We don't like it at right. the moment, but in retrospect, we can see that it's been very valuable. Okay, us. good for you. So as a, a manager, we used to say, you got to bring this employee to a crisis point, right? I ha you have an employee, so they come in 10 minutes late every day, and you say to them, please come in on time. Second time, you give them a letter, please come in on time. Third time, you say to them, what did you plan on doing after with the rest of your life. You're not going to keep working here. Bringing them to this crisis point that does like Sister Ann says, when that crisis point happens, guess what? That's a memory that sticks with you. There are some managers say, you don't remember anything until tears shed. Once you, those tears shed, you say, okay, I got through to you. We understand each other. Sometimes it requires that shedding of a tear before we get the point, right? We're just tripping along until we meet up with that crisis and you say, oh my goodness, that thing left a mark. Here's a question for you all, folks. When you're going through this time, this dark valley, are there any texts in this book that you say, oh my goodness, not this book, oh my goodness, There's, this text always has helped me through this time. Do you, have you committed to your memory any text? And I just, brother, thank you. A text that's kind of say, okay, this is my text. It gets me through this. Okay. All right, give it to me. Amen. Amen. Anybody else have a text that you say, hey, this thing kind of helps me get through these tough times when I'm in these tough places? She's got it. Well, don't share. Do she share? Okay. I wrote it on the wall in the living room. Right. Right. There you go. That happens. That happens to me every week.
Amen. You'll seek me. Okay, good for you. Amen. When you search with me, no, give it to me, brother. Okay, I love that one. That's a good one, right? Mine has always been John 16 and 33. I just already said it to you, but I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. There's something about that that just gives me peace when I say, oh my goodness. The Lord is not being silly by saying you're not going to ever have problems. He's saying, hey, you are going to have problems. I'm telling you all these things so you can be ready for them, right? But take heart, yes. 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 Have, okay. Yes. There's a text that says that, that the Lord has numbered the hairs upon our head, right? You guys know that text? He numbered the hairs upon our head. And that's not like just saying, I know the number, Bill, you have 10,000 hairs on your head. He's saying, I numbered each one. Oh, looks like number 3,500 just fell out on the ground. <laughs> He's numbered them. Not just the total. Yes, brother in the back and then brother in the front. Yes. Yes. When we used to go camping as a kid, I would read that one in my mind because, uh, you know, we're, we're from a small town, but we were city kids, if you know what I mean. We're out there camping. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, there's something back here. And when I think about that, I say to myself, the Lord is around us, right? He's encamped himself around us. He's in the camp with us. And it's like, oh, thank you, Lord. You're in the camp. Brother Jack. Yes, mine's Isaiah 65, 24. It says, before they fall. Oh, here while they are oh my goodness. Yes. When we went through the fire. Yes. God had already set it up the day before. Yes. And the help I needed. And and when I was praying that I found that's when he sent the help there. Yes, and amen. I, Even before you called out to him, he knew this thing was gonna Oh my goodness. I love that one. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, y'all. Here, listen to this question. The next text says, I prepare a table be in the presence of your enemies. I prepare for you this table of food in the presence of your enemies. So I ask you this, what, why would the Lord prepare in front of your enemies? Why wouldn't he just scatter your enemies? Why, wh wh why prepare it in front of your enemies? What does that say to you? Is anybody, does that grab you anyway? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so give me something more. No, it just says to me that he is not intimidated yes. by your problems. Yes. He's not intimidated by your enemies. They seem intimidating to you, but to him it's like, come on, man. I'm not intimidated by that. Okay, so let me ask your time. And you have enemies. Don't raise your hands. This is a trick question. How many of you have enemies? Don't raise your hands. It's a trick question. How many people look at you as an enemy? I'm not saying that you have this person as an enemy. There's a person you know that you've worked with that said, hmm, there's something about this guy I don't like. Our dog, for instance, he knows when I'm mad at him. You know when there's somebody that doesn't like you. That's just how it is. You know it. I worked with a guy. I'm not going to say his name because we're on TV, maybe. He didn't like me. I don't know what I did to him. In fact, after one of the meetings, he was my boss's boss. So he was a big guy. And I, after a meeting, he treated me rough during the meeting. I closed the door afterward and I said, what's your problem? What is your problem? What have I ever done to you that's giving you this heartburn? And he looked at me and said, I don't know, but there's something about you I don't like. He said it to me. It's my boss's boss. And I said, something I can work on? There's something that I did? What? He said, I don't know. I just don't like you. He said it to me. Yes, he said it. And I said, you know what? It made me feel relieved that he said it. I got to say it made me feel relieved because I said, in my, before he said it, it was just in my head. I thought this guy didn't like me. I could see he was acting weird toward me. But when he said it out loud, I said, hallelujah. Ah, I feel relieved. Now I know. And I said to him, hey, listen to this. If I've ever done anything to offend you, I'm a Christian. Please forgive me. Right? If it comes to your mind and you want to write it on a piece of paper, bring it to me. I will ask forgiveness for it. Whatever it is, please forgive me. 
let's move on. You don't like me because I comb my hair to the right or the left. There's nothing I can do about that. But the fact that you said it, he looked smaller to me. He was my boss's boss. Before that, I was intimidated by him. But when he said it, the Lord became the boss and he became smaller. He just did something to me. And I said, oh my goodness, this dude has just freed me. And so I say to you, folks, do you have enemies that you pray for that the Lord has set down a table right in front of this person? That they are now the small person. You have become lifted up. Oh my goodness. Come on now. Come on, sister. Yes. He wants them to join the table, right? Oh my goodness. Thank you, sister. We're intimidated by things as Christians. We, we're, tra we're, we're, we're trained to be the meek person, right? <laughs> the Lord is our shepherd. We don't lack anything, right? And he's not intimidated by our enemies, brother and sister, brother. You know, this is something that I thought about often because in a lot of the Psalms, you hear um, you know, David saying, you know, Lord, deliver me and enemies be like crushed, you know, all these things. And I, I really prayed about this because when I was at Southern during the summers, I would I would uh, be a counseling leader. And uh, one time there was a policeman that came and we were canvassing. We had a permit, we had everything. And he came and he harassed my students so bad that like my girl students, they were crying. Wow. I mean, us like criminals, you know, and uh, I just remember praying to God and like saying, like, God, like, put this man like down, long, you know? drop him because <laughs> yeah, I understand if he would have come and but would have been respectful, but he was just very, very mean, very nasty. And I never really understood that because at the same time, like, you have these things in the Bible. But also, Jesus is like, love your enemies. Yes. Do good to those enemies. Yes. So I'm like, all right, what is it? So it's just something that I've struggled with, you know, which one is it? Okay, so brother, that's the next question I have for you. Sister. I have the answer to this question. Okay. The answer. I used to also think that because I'm narcissistic enough that if I have an enemy, I really don't want good for them. Okay. I, I want them to suffer. Okay. And then I started analyzing, because that's another thing I like to do. And I realized that if, all right, this one person I've not tolerated for many, many years, if I were to meet him in heaven, what would be, what right. would be the reaction? Right. And my solution was, well, obviously then all the evil things that I didn't like about him would not be there. Mm -hmm. In other words, he would not be there. Or, okay. So refining the process more the only thing i didn't like about him is the devil in him hmm. so when i pray for the destruction the utter annihilation of my enemy i only have one hmm. and that's the devil okay good for god you. has already promised me his destruction okay so i pray for the destruction in the person's life of my enemy of that devilish thing so when that part is out of them, like me, they'll be a new person. Okay, good for you, sister. Okay, so Brother Daniel said it, sister said, said it. They both asked this question, how, do, how is it possible for us to reach that place that Jesus said in, in Matthew 5 and 44, where he said, love your enemy. Ooh. How is it possible for us to get to that place if we're intimidated by our enemies? How do we get to the place where we say, I'm going to love this person somehow? Because it's not you. I think okay. I think not you. We begin by praying for them. Yes. Yes. And for us. Yes. Our heart would be soft. Okay. So this enemy that I told you about me, that I confronted in his office, that wasn't the first day. People were saying to me, hey, Cook, what did you ever do to so-and-so? He's our big boss. He hates you, one of them said to me. He doesn't like you. And I said... Well, maybe you can do a little reconnaissance, find out what I ever did to this guy. I don't remember doing anything to him. And <clears throat> nobody could come back and say a thing. So I said to Lorna, Lorna, 
this person we got to put on the top of a list, the prayer list. I got to pray for this guy every day before I go into his office and just lay it on him, right? Because my heart has to be ready. Because here's the thing. I'm like a dog, right? If I know you don't like me, I'm not going to confront you at first. I'm going to try to avoid you. Every time I saw the guy coming, I was headed someplace else. And he wanted to talk to me. Oh, I'm busy. I got to, you know, I didn't want to be intimidated by this guy. I was intimidated by him. And I wasn't happy with myself because that feeling of fear is a feeling you cannot live with for long, right? It just eats you up. How many of you say, Monday, I got to go back to work. I just don't want to be in that place. Or Tuesday, I got to go back to work. Some of you have Monday off. Tuesday, I got to go back to work, and I just can't stand to see the face of those people if I have to see them again. I just don't think I'm going to be able to make it. And I said to Lorna, I can't live like this for long. I'm going to either have to find a new job. I'm going to have to kill the guy in his sleep. I'm going to pray that he has a heart attack or something's going to have to happen here. And so we started to pray, dear Lord, this guy, you got to touch his heart. You got to touch me first that I don't feel intimidated by him. And let me know that you're the Lord of Lords. And this guy is just one of your people. Here's something that happened after I confronted him. The guy had a bad accident, self-inflicted thing, stupid things that men do. He was riding on a motorcycle. He got hurt. He came into work because we're macho two days after the after having a crash. You know, he's the boss's boss's boss. He can't be sick. He can't be weak. He can't show weakness. So he comes in on crutches. And I see the guy in the hall and I say, is that the guy that, oh my goodness. And so I made myself his servant. And I said to him, brother, you should have stayed home, number one. You got a lot of sick leave. Why are you at work? Oh, he says, I'm the boss. Okay, well, we know you're the boss, whether you're here or not. I'm going to help this guy in things that he can't do, and I helped him do some stuff that I'm going to just say, this is after I confronted him. And he said to me, you are a Christian. He said that to me, you are a Christian. I hated you. I don't know why, but I hated you. But now, this is after you confronted me and you told me about God, I just, I, oh, I can't hate you. And I said, sorry? I mean... <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, dude. That's how it works. I saw him as a human being after that, right? He could see me in a different light. And he could see the Lord in a different light, right? And so I'm saying to you, those of you who have to go to work on Tuesday, I know who you are. Believe me. You're dreading it. Oh, my goodness. Why can't the 4th of July be on the 6th? You're going to be okay. We serve a God who's a good God. He's the shepherd of all, right? He's the shepherd. He's leading us down these good places, but he also is with us in the dark places, in the rough valleys, in the tough nights. He's with us. And we fear no evil. He's with us. He's encamped himself around us. He's got angels around us, and we're in a good place. And we're going to spend the next quarter looking at some tough places but the Lord is still there. And some of those places are going to be hot and some of them are going to be taking something out of us that shouldn't be there. Some impurity that's in us, that's left in us, some fear. Maybe it's something else. Who knows? Maybe you'll discover. Will you pray over the next 13 weeks that the Lord will reveal to you what that thing is that He's trying to get out of you through the crucible? Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, sister. Sister in the back, she says amen when nobody else says it. Amen. We're going to spend the next several weeks praying, Lord, there's something within us that has to come out, and it's only going to come out in a very heated situation, apparently. Ugh. But you're going to be with us through that heated situation. Nobody likes to pray for the heated situations. Okay, so let's bow our heads. Lord, we know that you're our shepherd. We recognize your voice, and you know our voice. You know who we are, and we follow you. We want to follow you, Lord. <sighs> but we're scared. We're scared sometimes. We like to follow you in the still waters, but we don't like to follow you in the dark places. And we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us, encourage us to go with you, even in the dark places, that we know no fear because you're with us. That's our prayer in Jesus' name.